Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm your one of your hosts, Katie Halper. I'm the second of the two hosts, Aaron Mate. And we're so excited to be talking to you today and bringing you a great show as usual. A great episode of Useful Idiots. Viewers and listeners of the show uh, who watch our Monday morning live streams may know that I did announce that I'd seen a movie uh, and I was teasing that fact. I didn't tell you what movie I saw and now it's time for me to tell you the movie I saw and it was indeed King Richard starring Will Slap Smith. Uh, He played uh, Richard Williams, the father of Serena Williams and Venus Williams. And I'm going to say he did a good job. Uh, It was a good movie. Some good tennis scenes. I don't even like tennis. I don't really know about it. I don't understand what the hell the love means. What are they talking about when they say love? Do you know this, Aaron? Matt Wilson, do you know this? It just means zero. Oh. Oh, love. Oh, you mean love is a tennis term. Yeah. 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 I had no idea. Okay. It means zero. (laughs) Why the hell do they call it love? That's a great question. Yeah, right? I don't know. Why do they call it deuce? What does deuce mean? 40-40. Well, that makes sense, right? A deuce could be 20. What? Uh, yeah, Katie, I, I think your tennis education had just begun. With uh, Yeah, you're right. I have a lot to learn. It sounds like I'm, a lot I'm to learn. Yeah, yeah, I'm very excited. <laughs> and, you know, Aaron, as, you, as a major fan uh, and Substack supporter of Useful Idiots, you, I'm sure, know that Matt Taibbi and I uh, have a very popular feature where we review films that we haven't seen or TV shows that we haven't seen. Okay. So I, as someone who only saw the only film I saw, whose uh, best actor uh, was nom- who with an actor nominated for best actor in the Oscars was Will Smith. So now I'm going to bring you my assessment of who should have won the Oscar for best actor. And the choices were um, Javier Bard them for being the Ricardos, Benedict Cumberbatch for The Power of the Dog, Andrew Garfield for Tick, Tick, Boom, uh, Will Smith, of course, for King Richard, and Denzel Washington for The Tragedy of Macbeth. Now, having not seen any of those, I'm going to say that I think the person who deserved the award was Javier Bardem. Hmm. The only film of those I saw was Macbeth with Denzel. How was it? Of course, he did an amazing job, but I just feel like, you know, giving an award for a Shakespeare at this point, I think you should, I I think Shakespeare should be exempt. I I think we need to reward original material. What did you like most about Javier Bardem's performance? I liked, well, what I didn't love is that he was a Spaniard playing a Cuban, but what I loved was that when I didn't see it, I forgot that he was Spanish. And that well, is, that's good acting. That's good fantastic acting. acting. Yeah. And Aaron, it's who did you pick to win? Well, I did see Will Smith's acceptance speech. Right. And so that's why I would have picked him to win again, because I would not want that acceptance speech to not happen, because that was an incredible acceptance speech. It was crazy. Well, you know what? I'm going to agree with you, because that acting alone was superb. It was impressive. It was impressive. His, his yes, pretending that he was a, a feminist martyr. Absolutely. Um, to cover for his slapping Chris Rock was very well done. But then again, we saw him get some coaching from Denzel Washington. So maybe Denzel is responsible for that performance, which makes me think that he maybe deserve it, deserves it too. But that brings us back to the Shakespeare rule that we just inaugurated. So he's exempt. He's out. Yeah, he's out. Yeah. So he's I think out. we can all agree that actually I'm going to rescind my Javier Bardem endorsement and go with Will Smith. So justice was done. Well, speaking of justice, we have a little segment called the four food groups. Oh, yeah. In which we serve out justice equally to the Democrats Democrats, and Republicans Republicans. and argue why they both suck. So for Democrats suck, we have a ruling that just came down from the UK where a British court has just formally authorized the extradition of Julian Assange, WikiLeaks making the announcement today. The decision now goes to the UK, the UK Home Secretary, Priti Patel, and Assange's legal team will make a submission to try to uh, appeal. But this is just one more step in what is the Democratic, the, what is the Democrats' policy now in extraditing Julian Assange. Biden came into office. He could have dropped this prosecution. It began under William Barr's Justice Department and the Trump administration. Biden could have dropped it, but he didn't. He's kept it going. And now we're at this point now where a journalist who exposed war crimes 
now faces extradition to the U.S. and spending the rest of his life in prison. Yeah, it's really awful. And again, just a reminder that this was Donald Trump's uh, decision. I mean, Obama, of course, started out prosecuting uh, Julian Assange, but he he stopped. Uh, he kind of stopped it in his tracks. He didn't he didn't pardon him. He should have done much more, but he stopped pursuing him. Uh, he kind of left him alone in the embassy, which is hardly cause for for praise or celebration. But he decided not to pursue uh, Assange the way that Donald Trump did. And so Biden is being Trumpian and not Obama in in his uh, pursuit of Julian Assange. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's just a shameful, shameful, shameful moment. It is uh, a dark moment of history. As you pointed out, Aaron, uh, this is a someone who exposed major war crimes. And we see again and again that the only people who are punished for war crimes are people who blow the whistle on it. And the only person who was punished for CIA torture program was the one person who blew the whistle on that. That's John Kiriakou. The people who blew the whistle on on the war crimes, Julian Assange, uh, Ed Snowden and Chelsea Manning, they've all been uh, persecuted. And it's, again, very shameful, and people should be up in arms about this. This is a terrible attack on the fourth estate, terrible attack on free press, a terrible attack on the First Amendment, and it is so embarrassing that the press is being so silent in in the face of this. Yeah, and it comes at a time when public discussion of war crimes, like the brand of war crimes, has never been more in the conversation. Everyone's talking about war crimes now because of what Russia has allegedly done inside Ukraine. We constantly hear about Russian war crimes, Russia being brought to the International Criminal Court. Well, meanwhile, the U.S. is imprisoning a journalist for exposing U.S. war crimes. You know, And the same media that constantly talks about Russian war crimes is pretty much silent about Julian Assange's fate, or and some people even support it. It's just indefensible. And again, one of the reasons that Obama stopped pursuing Assange was or didn't ratchet up his prosecu- persecution of Assange was because of the New York Times problem, right, which is just logical, which is that if it was so criminal of Assange to publish the things that he published, then obviously it was criminal of the New York Times to publish that, uh, of The Guardian to publish that, of Der Spiegel to publish that, of El País to publish that. It just makes no sense to have one person who published it be um, responsible for criminal behavior and others not be. And again, another thing that's embarrassing is that the star witness in the case against Assange has admitted to to lying. That's right. Anyway, so that's a uh, another depressing reason why Democrats suck. Yeah. Shame on you, Joe Biden. OK, so for Republicans suck, we have uh, an interesting moment. Uh, Ted Cruz uh, speaking truth to, to, to Disney power. I think there are people who are misguided trying to drive, you know, Disney stepping in saying, you know, in every episode now they're going to have, you know, (laughs) you know, Mickey and Pluto going at it like, (laughs) really? Thank you for that image, Senator. You know, oh, no, but it's no. just like, come on, guys. Like, like these are kids, and, and you know, y- you can always shift to Cinemax if you want that. Like, like why do you have... It used to be... Look, I'm a dad. Like, you used to be able to put your kids on the Disney Channel and be like, all right, something innocuous will happen. Ted Cruz made these very humorous, I guess some people thought, comments at a live taping of his podcast, verdict with ted cruz it's it's weird it's a weird comment i don't know where he gets this information maybe he has some some intel that uh apparently in every episode now of disney they're gonna have mickey and pluto going at it you can always shift to cinemax if you want that now that's weird on a couple of levels one is it's not funny but the other thing is that i'm not sure i would mention cinemax and make jokes about like kind of Basically, he's, this is a porn. We qualify this as a, we characterize this as a porn joke, right? That's what this is, a porn-based joke. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, do you guys remember this? He once liked a short pornographic video on his Twitter account. I don't remember that. You may have blocked it out. Uh, Ted Cruz Twitter account likes pornographic tweet. Mary, mm-hmm. Texas senator who once defended a ban on sex toys, asked uh, to explain how his account came to like the graphic post. And if you scroll down. You'll see now they kind of they blurred it out, but I guess 
journalist uh, Ashley Feinberg tweeted, Ted Cruz, my young daughters and sons follow you for good wholesome content. Can you please explain this? And what he did was he himself tweeted out a screenshot of uh, a liked post that uh, Ted Cruz had liked. And it looks like someone, you can't really tell, it looks like there's some activity on a bed between a man and a woman. And then there's a woman in the foreground who's engaging in some self-service yeah, it was a like tweet. And again, I don't care. I'm not kink shaming. It's just that you can't really claim to be if you're going to ban sex toys and also uh, go after Disney for uh, kind of invented alleged um, hot Pluto on uh, who was it Pluto Mickey. and hot Mickey. Pluto on Mickey content. Yeah. You probably want to clean up your side of the street first. And uh, then then they their their response to this was weird. They they blamed a congressional staffer for his Twitter account liking a short pornographic video. Now, I don't know how that would happen. Always blame staff. the staff. Always, Always blame, blame the, the staff. staffer. Yeah. That's what they're there for. Yeah, uh, that's imagine, what they're there for. Imagine being a young, fresh-faced college freshman or graduate. You go to Washington. It's your dream to serve the people, to be a part of public service. You get an internship at Senator Cruz's office or even a staff job. You're excited to make a difference, and boom, you immediately get blamed for liking a porn tweet on Twitter. That's awful. I thought you were going to say, imagine starting out as a staffer, a fresh-faced young staffer, then you hack into your, you, you go onto your uh, boss's laptop, the senator, you're, you know, you're scrolling through porn on his laptop, and then you pretend, you forget that you'd been signed in as Ted Cruz, and you like the porn tweet. That's the cover story, at least. That's the yeah. cover story, I guess, yeah. That's the official story. Yeah. So that's our that's our uh, Republican suck because he just he sucks. I just love how amidst all the other things going on that Republicans can't stop talking about this Disney thing is that this is the most important thing in the world. There's a war in Ukraine and right. that's our spectrum right now. Like our Democratic um, politicians are talking about arming Ukraine more. This is a fight for democracy, all that stuff. <laughs> Republicans meanwhile are talking about Disney <laughs> and Disney content. Yeah. yeah. Also, I mean, wouldn't it be Mickey and Goofy? going at it not mickey and pluto that's a great oh, point that's a great even, point you couldn't even master the it's not line. person on dog legislation i mean i'm gonna say yes and no because remind me again it's Pluto. this cruz is talking about mickey on pluto which would yeah. be his pet um, dog not his friend dog mouse and dog right, <laughs> right? mouse and yeah. mouse and his pet pet dog yeah pluto right? is yeah but he okay. also has a friend dog there's a difference so who's the friend dog? Goofy. The, the legislation is about gay people. So the two best friends are Mickey right. and Goofy. It's not about Mickey and Pluto, right? A pet. Which well, a pet, yeah. Right. Except you know that one of the major slippery slope ar arguments against same sex marriage is what's next, man and dog. So Ted Cruz is a level ahead of us. Yeah. He's just, yeah. He's, a, he's ahead of us. He's just, you, you know, that is, he's, I'd say he's on brand. For it's the <laughs> for homophobia, for the homophobe, for family values, porn liking homophobia. Absolutely on brand. Let's agree on that. Absolutely on brand. And it's interesting that there's a woman in this porn clip that he liked. It's not just a wholesome pornographic video of a man and a woman, although there is a man and a woman involved on the bed. There's a woman watching, which suggests some, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know how the scene's going to unfold, but there's certainly a potential for bisexuality there's a lot of potential there yes high potential yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so cruz yeah. couldn't even find a didn't even like a video a porn video that was family values friendly no all right so that's a republican suck okay so for isn't that weird katie we have a very weird development coming out of the world of msnbc the unofficial state network of the democratic party where Malcolm Nance, a longtime MSNBC pundit, hardcore Russia Gator, former naval officer, has now taken, you know, pro proxy war punditry to the next level, where he's not just shilling for the war in Ukraine, he's now on the ground in Ukraine volunteering. He's not just shilling, he's shelling. He's not just shilling, he's shelling. <laughs> exactly. Let's watch the clip. And he is wearing camo and holding a gun. Well, as you know, I spent quite a bit of time here in the pre-war period. And when the invasion happened, I had friends who were in Donetsk, who were in the Ukrainian army, who were writing to us and telling us 
we're not going to survive tonight. We've been hit 500 times. Uh, you know, these are graduates at Defense Language Institute. These are my friends. And, you know, as the more I saw of the war going on, the more I thought, I'm done talking. All right. It's time to take action here. So uh, about a month ago, I joined the International uh, Legion here in Ukraine, and I am here to help this country fight, you know, what essentially is a war uh, of, of, its, of ex extermination. This is an existential war, and Russia has bought it to these people, and they are mass murdering civilians. And there are people here like me who are here to do something about it. So that's Malcolm Nance. I mean, hey, to his credit. Hey, you know what he is, Aaron? He's Malcolm in the middle of a war. That's, that's, that's good. That's good. Yes, he is. Now, the question, though, is, is he really in the middle of the war? Is Malcolm, is he really gone from shilling to shelling? Because that, that photo op to me just seems a little bit too convenient. I really doubt he's on the front lines. Maybe I'm wrong. Right. And uh, I wish him the best. And, you know, look, to his credit, he... He's not, just sit, mouth is. Yeah, he's not just sitting in a studio. He's, he's on the ground. But will he really be deployed at the front lines? I don't know. I'm skeptical. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah. the broader point here is that, you know, we talk about potential areas of radicalization. You know, uh, we talk about, you know, how do people get radicalized to do what they do? In the case of Malcolm Nancy, it was none other than, than MSNBC. You're right. They, ra they turned him into a foot soldier. A foot soldier, yeah, taking up arms, you know. Yeah. Uh, fighting in a force that has attracted right wingers from around the world. Not that everyone who's gone to fight in Ukraine right, is a right winger, but there is a contingent that is because they have the neo Nazi Azov Battalion incorporated into their into their army. Right. And so this American radical, aka also an MSNBC pundit, has joined the fight. And that's weird. From armchair, you can't call him an armchair pundit anymore. No, you cannot. So that's our isn't that weird now for isn't that terrible uh this is a doozy i gotta warn you especially people out there who have penises uh, oh no this is a trigger warning yeah no not again yeah i can't help it it's not me it's not me guys it's the news so let's we've read had, let's look at this we've had article. a lot of we've had a lot of penis related content and isn't that weird or isn't that terrible it just yeah, keeps yeah we up. do it just keeps coming yeah. up no pun intended let's take a look at this story and of course if you want good penis related content you can always rely on the New York Post. All right. Man's stomach pains turns out to be headphone wire lodged in his bladder. Look, we've all been there. Okay. A man's stomach pains turned out to be caused by a 31 inch headphone wire lodged in his bladder. And the reason it got stuck there in the first place shocked doctors. The 34 year old patient from Indonesia went to the emergency department saying he had agony when urinating. Doctors were stunned when he revealed he had inserted an earphone wire into his urethra while masturbating. He did this between three to five times a week for sexual pleasure and gratification. But this time, the man could not take the wire out when it became lodged in his bladder, which was visible and quickly identified by the team. The wire was coiled and fortunately had not attached to the bladder wall, and extraction was performed using grasping forceps. The earphone wire was found to be 1 16th of an inch in size and 31 inches in length. Doctors warned a foreign object like this could have gotten tangled inside the bladder and more difficult to retrieve. The patient was discharged oh, the next day. According to the story published in Radiology Case Reports, he, quote, showed no apparent psychotic behaviors and was mentally well, end quote. He had no psychotic symptoms, OCD, anxiety, or depression, which are more common in such cases of unique fetishes. A psychiatric team diagnosed polyembolocoilomania. The act of, insertin, of inserting foreign bodies into orifices, such as the rectum and vagina, well, obviously the urethra too. Inserting objects into the urethra, oh, is normally described as urethral sounding. I think, honestly, I'm glad that this guy was so forthcoming. I'm glad that he was forthcoming. He didn't waste any time. I guess he couldn't because it was visible, so there was no real moral quandary there. So the good news, it was visible. And uh, I'm just glad his penis is getting better. And I don't know, I don't want to kink shame, but there has to be a solution. There has to be a way that people can enjoy this without risking death or bladder infection removal, et cetera. There has to be a better way. To all the people whose penises we've discussed on the show, we continue to wish you a speedy recovery. Yes, we do. 
with whatever your issue is. Yeah. Recently, we talked about a guy who masturbated like four times on a flight. Right. Uh, there was another, there was the, there was the drug addict who was having some problem with his text, his testicles too. Yeah. Right. And now, and now this, you know, just hearing this story, Katie, I, you know, there's a line from Bobby Womack, the soul singer that I really like where he just, he starts off a song and he goes, you know, everyone's got their own thing. And that's really what I just think of here. Everyone's got their own thing. And this is this guy's thing. This is his and, thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And your thing, Katie, appears to be finding really horrific uh, penis related I mean, anecdotes yeah. and saying, them, saying this on the show. And, and that's your thing, too. And that's OK. You know, yeah, I, I think of this as a PSA. I want to warn people <laughs> against I want them to know the risks when they're engaging in this behavior, because apparently it's not that uncommon. And by PSA, do you mean public safety announcement or penis yeah. safety announcement? I mean, I think yeah. we know that I mean both. And I thank okay. you for pointing that out. Sure. Aaron, I thank uh, you for the pun, because I think the real terrible is a New York Post penis article with no puns. Zero yeah, puns. Yeah, you're right. Mm. There were zero puns. You know mm. what? This was a very boring one. No puns whatsoever. You're right. Well, that's Thank that's you how you know it's us. that's how you know it's serious is when the the writers can't even bring themselves to make a pun. Then they're well, like, "Whoa, right. this is too it's this is too, too heavy for a pun." Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what it is. This story originally appeared on the Sun and was mm. reproduced here with permission, so it doesn't have this signature New York Post pun based pun flair. There we go. That's what it is. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and of course, and, it, of course, it first came in the sun because that's a British tabloid. Right. right? So, of course, they had it first. Well, British right. tabloids, which which actually shine a very important light on, on these stories that other uh, outlets are too ashamed to touch with a 10 foot headphone. Yeah. Cord. And, and you people may remember that another urethral sounding story included a 30 year old man who got a two foot long mobile phone charger stuck in his bladder. He initially claimed that he had swallowed the cable. I remember reporting on that. Now that's not, don't do that guys. Cause he had to have two types of, of surgery. I think it, de it definitely delayed it, but um, just keep that stuff away. Find a safe way to do it. I'm not, I don't know how, but there has to be a better way. And if all else fails, just give up electronics completely. It's not worth yeah, it. It's Become true. a Luddite. Become a Luddite. Right. If the temptation is too great, you can't be yeah. around it. Save your just penis. Find, become a Luddite. Save your penis. penis become a Luddite. That was definitely terrible. That was definitely terrible. What's a relatively yeah. happy ending, though? Yes. We, check, we can check the, the terrible box. Yeah. yeah. All right. So we have a great show for you guys. Yes. This week, we are joined to discuss the latest in Ukraine by Scott Ritter. He is a former Marine Corps intelligence officer and the former chief UN weapons inspector in Iraq. That's a position he actually resigned from in the late 1990s when he voiced concern that his office was being used to basically further regime change goals. And that proved to be very prescient because a few years later, when the Bush administration tried to, you know, launch the case to invade Iraq, they used UN weapons inspectors for that effort. And Scott Ritter very forcefully spoke out against that and basically tried to stop a war, which ultimately he couldn't stop. But he did a very heroic thing in speaking out and making the case that the Bush administration was lying about Iraq WMDs. And now with this war in Ukraine, Scott has been an outspoken voice. He is using his military expertise and particularly his, his studies of the Russian military. He spent a long time studying the Russian military to comment on the war in Ukraine. And for his services, he recently got banned from Twitter for life because- For life? Think, for life, yeah. Oh, because he had one Twitter ban before and then he got reinstated and now it's for life? Now it's for life. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Because I think Twitter is cracking down on voices of dissent. Right. Uh, when it comes to the war in Ukraine. And Scott is a particularly well-informed voice of dissent. So now he's gone. And uh, we're here to hear what he has to say, which he can't say on Twitter. Wow. All right, so let's go to Scott Ritter. Scott Ritter, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Can you discuss your own kind of evolution when it comes to, when it came to Iraq and WMDs? Sure. Um, you know, before I went to Iraq, I, uh, I helped write the book on on-site inspection as a, uh, an inspector with the United States military operating in the former Soviet Union, implementing the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. Prior to that, the notion of having um, live inspectors on the ground checking out compliance verification of an arms control treaty didn't happen. Nobody trusted them. They all thought they were going to be spies. So, 
know, I had a lot of experience doing, um, doing on-site inspection. I helped write the book for on-site inspection. And when I was invited to, uh, to join the United Nations to set up an intelligence unit uh, in August of 1991, the UN doesn't do intelligence. They, they don't, that's not their job. Um, normally they get assistance from other nations, but we had a situation where by the time I was invited, the uh, inspectors had been on the ground in Iraq. This is after the end of the Gulf War, when the world found that sanctions couldn't be lifted against Iraq until they had been disarmed of their weapons of mass destruction, chemical, biological, nuclear, long range ballistic missiles. A lot of people say, you know, today there's this thing, well, there were no WMD in Iraq. No, 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 no. There were a lot of WMD in Iraq. Iraq was overflowing with them. They had massive chemical weapons program. They had a gigantic long range missile program. They had a nuclear weapons program that was six months away from reaching fruition. And they had an ongoing biological uh, weapons um, program. Uh, they failed to declare their biological weapons program. They failed to declare their nuclear weapons program. They underdeclared their chemical and ballistic missile program. So the inspectors were beating their heads against the wall, literally. And one of the problems we had now is how to uncover the lies. That's where I came in. I was brought in to create an intelligence unit that would receive information, turn this information into inspection uh, data that would be handed over to inspectors. Uh, eventually, what happened is because of my experience as an inspector, I didn't just get the intelligence, I did the inspection. So I was in charge of the entire cycle, uh, receiving data, focusing the data into a target, inspecting the data, collecting more data, coming back, reevaluating in the cycle. We were looking for not just material, but evidence of concealment. The Iraqis were hiding this stuff. So it was a very complicated uh, process. A lot of human intelligence, a lot of signals intelligence, a lot of imagery intelligence, and just a lot of old fashioned elbow grease on the ground in Iraq in very, very contentious situations. We were going after targets that the Iraqis didn't want us to go after. I had a pistol put to my head several times. I had rifles shoved in my face. They were gonna blow my brains out on the wall for daring to do what I was doing. And had I blinked, it would have all been over. Not that I would have been dead, but once you blink in the face of that, your credibility as an inspector is finished. So you just had to stand there and dare them to pull the trigger. And they didn't, thank goodness. But uh, the point is, this was a very active, aggressive, controversial process. By the time I finished in 1998, we could account for 90 to 95% of Iraq's WMD. Now people say that's not 100%, that's what the Security Council said. See, the Security Council passed a disarmament resolution under chapter seven, which said that Iraq's retention and possession of this material constituted a threat to the international community worthy of war. The standard for disarmament was 100%. I didn't make that standard. The international community made that standard. So as an inspector, I said, we can, we've can we accomplished 90 to 95%, but I can't tell you where the final five to 10% is, where it went. We're investigating it. And now the United States won't let me finish my investigation. My investigations require kicking down doors, being in the face of the Iraqis, and you have to back me up while we do this, or we're not going to find that missing information. The United States reneged. They weren't interested in the truth, because had I found the remaining 5 to 10 percent, and we were close to finding the remaining 5 to 10 percent, then they would have to lift the sanctions. And now Saddam Hussein is no longer constrained. He's welcome back to the international community. U.S. goal was never disarmament. It was always regime change. So when I resigned, I pointed out to everybody, the U.S. government was stopping the process of inspection, and as long as they stopped the process of inspection by their own laws, by their own rules, Iraq represented a threat to international peace and security because the standard was 100%. I was defending the inspection process. My goal was to get inspectors back into Iraq to finish the job free of interference from either the Iraqi side or the, um, the, the United States. You know, I was defending the inspection process. In December 1998, um, the United States pressured the inspectors to go back into Iraq one last time, this time for the purpose of setting up a confrontation that would be used by the United States to kick the inspectors out, then bomb Iraq using the intelligence gathered by my team to target Saddam Hussein. Regime change. This failed. It was Operation Desert Fox, 72-hour bombing campaign. When that happened, I said, we're no longer in the business of, of trying to get inspectors back in. The United States just killed them. So now we have to talk about how do we bring this issue to a close? And that's where I, I, I reevaluated. I said, we're no longer bound by the 100% standard. We now have to talk about reality. And the reality is 
when we can have 90 to 95% of their material accounted for, mitigate against the unaccounted for material by monitoring the totality of Iraq's industrial infrastructure and knowing that what was not accounted for has a lifespan. And we're talking, we're now eight years into this process. So any chemical agent that was held onto is probably not valid. No biological agents valid. Um, missiles that were taken apart, buried underground or corroded. There is no WMD threat. So I said, other than have a quantitative analysis, which is accounting for every nut, bolt, and screw, why don't we bring in a qualitative analysis? And I wrote a paper. It was published in Arms Control Today in June of uh, 2000, the, the case for the qualitative disarmament of Iraq. You know what's interesting about that pay, paper? The very argument that I lay out in 2000 was the final CIA assessment released in 2005 when they said there were no WMD in Iraq. So that's my evolution on it. I've been assiduous with the facts, a stickler for integrity. Um, people say you flip-flopped. I didn't no, flip-flop. No, yeah. The world flip-flopped. The world went from supporting disarmament to supporting regime change, and the inspections were thrown you know, into the fire. Um, so be it. And let me ask you about the impression you formed of Joe Biden throughout this period. You came face to face in a Senate hearing where he brought you to testify. And the footage of it shows that he was very condescending towards you, he called you Scotty boy. I respectfully suggest they have responsibility slightly above your pay grade. Slightly above your pay grade to decide whether or not to take the nation to war alone or to take the nation to war partway, or to take the nation to war half at, halfway. That's a real tough decision. That's why they get paid the big bucks. That's why they get the limos and you don't. I mean this sincerely, I'm not trying to be flip because I think, and that's why I was said at the outset, the reason why I'm glad you did what you did, we should come to our milk. We should make a decision. But in terms of whether the Secretary of State has no more to consider than you do as the arms inspector, you didn't get in, didn't get my job done, get me in, period. You made the deal, right? That's the deal. A deal's a deal. Get me in. Scott Ritter, I'm ready to go. It's not how it works. Now, maybe it should work that way. But I, wouldn't you acknowledge that if you were President of the United States or the Secretary of State, you'd sit there and say, now, okay. Old Scotty boy didn't get in. We said he should get in. We want him to get in. It's important that he does get in. They're not going to let him in. So what are we going to do now? We know that France and Russia aren't going to be with us. We're quite confident China's not. We've already run those traps. They're not there. We're not sure where the United States Senate is, but have at it, boys. Go get them. And by the way, Scott and the boys say air power is not enough. <clears throat> I think it's a legitimate debate, Scott, or, uh, Major. I think it's a legitimate debate, but I don't think we should be putting it in the context of you have somebody up there at state saying, look, how can we weasel out of this agreement? We want to let this guy out there hanging. We're not we're not this. It's a very practical political decision. Same kind of decision General Powell made. Same kind of decision President Bush made. Every president, every secretary of state has to do it. Like I said. They get paid more than you. Their job's a hell of a lot more complicated than yours. They may have made the wrong decision, and you brought it to light. We should address it. We should say straight up where we are, and we should do it. And for that, I thank you. But it's above your pay grade. And essentially mocking what you were trying to do, which is get you, you, you and weapons inspectors on the ground and, and avoid a war. So based on that experience, what opinion did you form uh, of Joe Biden? How do you see him today as he presides over the U.S. role in the proxy war in Ukraine? You know, prior to my resignation and then uh, literally within two weeks of my resignation, testifying before a joint committee of the United States Senate, the first time ever the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and the Armed Services Committee had come together in a joint hearing. That's pretty uh, intimidating <laughs> for a guy who's tried to avoid the, uh, the spotlight. I wasn't, I, I can't say that I was a big player in in American politics. I was cognizant of, you know, things I studied. I took government 101 in college, but, um, you know, my goal, my, my job was disarm. My job was arms. Control. My job was the military fighting wars. Let the Congress guys do this. But now I'm, I was asked by the Senate to testify. And um, I knew that this was going to be politically contentious. I actually uh, asked to be um, subpoenaed 
because uh, that way uh, when I appeared, it wouldn't appear that I'd be at the guest of any party. I would be there, you know, compelled by a, a congressional. They, they said, no, no, we don't want to treat you that way. We, we want you to come. Uh, but it was a Republican controlled uh, uh, Senate. Uh, Trent Lott was the uh, majority leader at that time. And it was a Democratic president whose policies I was attacking. Uh, initially, it was going to be me testifying with Madeleine Albright, the Secretary of State, and William Cohen, the Secretary of Defense, because I was extremely critical of both. And uh, the idea was to get all three of us out there and have a clearing of the air. Well, Albright and Cohen bailed. And the reason why they bailed is simple. I was at every meeting. I knew everything. I was a critical participant. This wasn't some little Scotty boy um, out there playing in the playground, suddenly brought up into adult world and going, oh my God, what's going on with the adults? No, I was aware of it all. I knew it all, I knew what they agreed to. I knew everything about it. If he sat there next to me, the Senate hearing, they would have been humiliated. I would have destroyed them. So they bailed. But rather than cancel the hearing, the Republicans said, no, we're going to bring Ritter forward. Joe Biden was took the lead in trying to stop this. He, he did a parliamentarian move where he closed down the Senate. And the idea was by doing that, you can't have the hearing. Trent Lott did another unique thing. He Biden did something, but Trent Lott ended up shutting down the Senate, then bringing it back into a new session, and then walked me in to the Senate chambers. Now, I'm thinking this is cool. I'm being walked in by Trent Lott. What I didn't realize is I'd been walked in by the big dog for the Republican Party, and all the Democrats were up there seething because they <laughs> viewed this as a partisan political exercise. I was simply there to, to, to reveal the truth. No, I suddenly became a partisan enemy, and Joe Biden took the lead in taking me down. And he started with his opening statement where he called me Scotty Boy. This was above my pay grade. That's why they get the limos and I don't. You know, uh, Scotty Boy wants in, the whole, the whole nine yards. Um, you know, look, I, at the time, I was a little confused by what, I mean, I was angry. I, I was told ahead of time, just don't say anything. Um, so I just had to sit there and take it. Um, Later on, other senators came to my defense, and uh, it was a bad day for Joe Biden. Uh, he actually uh, got hammered. If you take a look, uh, the Washington Post, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, everybody wrote op-eds slamming him. He called to apologize. I was actually brought back to his office for a 45-minute uh, -on one-on-one uh, where he tried to clear the air about what he did. He, he wrote me a nice letter that said, uh, if you... If, this is, a, this is an issue that's not going to go away, and uh, I hope to be able to call upon you again if needed. He never called, and I tried to get him to call. I to him at one point, because when 2000 came up, I realized that we were heading towards war. We had a presidential election in place, and people were talking about the potential of going to war with Iraq about weapons of mass destruction. That article I wrote for Arms Control Today, I actually wrote because John Kerry a Democratic senator from the state of Massachusetts, when I called him on the phone to try and get a hearing, he said, put it in writing. So I put it in writing in the most prestigious arms control journal, and I had a copy sent to every senator and every congressperson. And then I called them up and said, let's meet. Well, you know who met with me? Chuck Hagel. Chuck Hagel met with me. Chuck Hagel met with me for an hour, and we had a great conversation. But when, when I said, what are you going to do about it? Because he agreed with me that the whole WMD thing was a fiasco. He said, you can't expect me to get ahead of my party in a presidential election year. It would be suicide for me to go alone. I said, well, what if I got Joe Biden to come with you? He said, you got Biden on board. I, could, so I called up Biden's people. I read him the letter. I said, Joe wanted to talk to me about this. Well, he didn't, he didn't meet with me. He sent his chief of staff. And when his chief of staff with, met with me, he called me a traitor, accused me of treason. I reminded him that I was a Marine. And if he said that one more time, I, I will show him why I'm a Marine. And I don't normally like to talk about violence, but you don't call me a traitor to my face, ever. And uh, he backed down, and we, we had a, a similar conversation with Hagel, and he agreed. He said, yeah, um, you're, you're probably right, but no, uh, we're not going to get ahead of Al Gore on this one. <laughs> we're, we're the same. I went back to Hagel and, and, and pushed him again. He said, don't expect any profile and courage moments from anybody in Congress when it comes to Iraq and WMP. The truth doesn't matter. Politics matter. And that's where I really got a bad opinion of Joe Biden. But it finally came in 2002 when I had been pressuring him and uh, Senator Luger to hold hearings on Iraq. And at first they said they wouldn't hold hearings. And then at the last second, they, they agreed to hold hearings, but they excluded me. They excluded anybody who had a, uh, a counter narrative than the one that they were pushing. Instead, there was a kangaroo court 
They brought in people who just simply hit their, their talking points home. And then Biden turned around and voted for a war. So you ask me where I stand with Joe Biden? The Marine in me says he stinks. He sucks. He's the worst because he went to war knowing it was a lie, knowing it was a lie, not maybe. He knew it was a lie. His chief of staff told me he knew it was a lie. And yet he held a hearing that lied to the American people about a threat that put Marines, soldiers, sailors, and airmen's lives at risk. Not hypothetically, people died. People died in Iraq, and not just our people, Iraqis. They didn't deserve this, but they got it. And the person that gave it to them, Joe Biden, he's the president of the United States today, and I have zero use for the man. There, that's about as honest as I can get. What you said was inconvenient to the, to the narrative, right? To the mainstream narrative or the establishment narrative. And you were shut down for that. How much of what you're going through today uh, is a repeat of that? Can you compare today's experience, your experience today, to the experience then with the Iraq War? Well, with the Iraq War back then, I was a player. I mean, I I was a real world player. I'm not bragging, but you know, yeah. um, if the Godfather was there, I'm the guy next to him. I'm 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 the big hit man. I'm Sammy the Bull, you know, who's going to go around and knock heads and all this kind of stuff. And I was such a player that when I, at the day I was going to resign, uh, the, the the CIA station chief in uh, New York City, uh, we have a station chief in New York City, he works at the UN mission, um, he advises the UN ambassador, he called me in and put me on the phone with a senior member of the National Security Council, who said, we understand you're resigning, please don't, if you do, you'll destroy the inspections, we need, need you here, stay. And I said, okay, I, I, I don't want to leave, but will you guys support the inspection process? Or is Madeleine Albright going to continue to pull the plug? And what you don't understand is the reason why I resigned is I was in Iraq at the head of a team armed with special intelligence um, about ballistic missile guidance and control equipment. And the intelligence had a short lifespan. And I had a team in place. We were ready to go. And when I say go, we were going to surround a building knowing we'd be surrounded and probably taken hostage. I'm not trying to be a hero here, but I'm telling you, this was as serious as it gets. I was ready. I had a team ready. We're a bunch of alpha dogs ready to do the job. And they pulled the rug out from underneath us, yanked us out. And uh, at that point in time, you can't get that hyped up and then down, and then try and do it again. So I said, no more. Are you guys going to let me do my job? Because you brought me in to do a job seven years ago. And you know who I am. You know what I do. Let me do my job. They said, no, we, we can't. I said, then I have to resign. When I hung up the phone, the CIA guy looked at me and he liked me. His name's Larry Sanchez. So I'm not trying to, you know, he's out. Um, uh, you know, he's, he wasn't covert. Uh, but he said, um, Scott, I like you. But when you walk out this building, I can't ever talk to you again. I said, okay, Larry. And he goes, and I want to let you know, the FBI is going to, I don't know what kind of language we can use on this podcast. Any, any language. They're going to fuck you in the ass. He said that fuck you in the ass. They're going to fuck your family. You're fucked if you turn in this resignation letter. I went, okay, I guess that's what's going to happen. And it, it did. I mean, that, that night, the FBI released a file uh, to uh, CBS Evening News. I was in a bar with the other inspectors. We were sort of drinking to my departure. And Dan Rather gets on the CBS Evening News and says, Scott Ritter is under investigation from the FBI for committing espionage on behalf of Israel. Well, that's because for since 1994, I've been flying to Israel with the CIA's permission, by the way, bringing U2 imagery that the CIA gave me to give to the Israelis, to have them interpret it, to give us target data to inspect. But no, nope, I was spying on behalf of Israel. This is a death sentence penalty, guys, a death sentence crime. Now, they weren't going to kill me, but life imprisonment, and I was not going to be found guilty but, you know, that sort of changes your life when they come at you like this. You now have to hire lawyers that you can't afford because I just lost my job. So I have to hire a lawyer I can't afford. And then we have to get into this long, lengthy, drawn out process because they don't want to bring it to a rapid conclusion. That's not how U.S. justice works. They drag it out to bankrupt you, to exhaust you, deny you employment opportunities. They fucked me in the ass. I won. Kind of and eventually, I went up against, uh, you know, uh, the lady's name was Mary Jo White. She used to be the um, U.S. attorney for the Southern District. And if you know anything about Mary Jo, Mary Jo wins all her cases. Mary Jo is the toughest terrorist fighter, criminal fighter in the world. Well, Mary Jo lost because I finally went and stared the FBI agents in the face and challenged them to put cuffs on me, to drag me out or get the fuck out of my life. Sorry for the language. But and they, the, the female agent that was, she cried. 
She was so apologetic. The, the, the other guy was red in the face. He was so sorry because he said, we don't want to be doing this, but we are following orders. We have to do this. Well, they sh shut the case down, but they find ways to fuck with you again. Look, it is what it is. Today, I'm not a player. I don't bring the same cachet to the argument that maybe I did as a uh, back in the day. So I don't think the U.S. government's too worried about what Scott Ritter has to say. Unfortunately, I got caught up in um, in in the, the the Twitter wars, I guess. Um, you know, the the post 2016 uh, Russia Gate phenomena, where everything Russia is bad all the time, every time. Everything dissenting is Russia. Apparently, right? You, it's you, not just you, Russia. I just if you're a dissenter, then that's just Russian disinformation. And uh, yeah, yeah, just to make just to make sure they took you off of Twitter. You've talked about this war in Ukraine not just being about the war in the Donbass between Kiev and Russian-backed rebels, and not just about NATO expansion, but also about the U.S. dismantling of arms control and increasingly surrounding Russia with offensive weapons, the missile sites in Poland and Romania, and uh, the increased ability for the U.S. to hit Russia as a result of it killing uh, treaties like the ABM Treaty, the anti ballistic Missile Treaty, and the INF Treaty. Does the war in, in Ukraine, does it make it more likely or less likely that those issues will be addressed? What it's going to do is bring these issues to a head. Either Russia is going to not only win in Ukraine, but win so decisively that, and 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 then because of the blowback on sanctions, <laughs> Europe, Europe is unable to sustain uh, this American policy of decoupling from, from Russia. Uh, Russia gets Europe to agree to a renegotiated European security framework, which is Russia's goal all along. And that will be inclusive of new arms control agreements that prohibit intermediate nuclear forces uh, that get rid of these anti-ballistic missile sites in Poland and Romania and um, seeks to remove tactical nuclear weapons from, from Europe altogether. That's the Russian objective. Or uh, Russia will win, Europe uh, refuses to engage, and now we have a new Cold War. In which case, the United States not only will retain what we what we're calling anti-ballistic missile sites in Poland and Romania, but they will convert them to offensive missile launch platforms. You know, the Mark Forty One Aegis Ashore system, which this is uh, right now, is configured to fire. A, I think it's an SM three surface air missile that can shoot down uh, missiles. But the same system can fire the uh, Tomahawk missile couldn't do that during the INF Treaty that was outlawed. But now that we're not members of the INF Treaty, within a month of us pulling out of the INF Treaty, we tested a Tomahawk from a Mark 41 launch canister. So we know that can happen. <clears throat> We've also converted the SM-3 into something called the SM-6 Typhoon, which is a surface-to-surface -surface missile. But that's not the most dangerous thing. The most dangerous thing is that We've activated, I think it's called the 56th uh, Field Artillery Brigade, but we have to go back and look at it. But it, it's a Cold War era unit. The, the last time it existed was when it was armed with Pershing II missiles, you know, the one that triggered the INF Treaty to begin with, because when a Pershing's launched 12 minutes later, it could hit Moscow. And the Russians said that's unacceptable. The whole world was on the, the, the cusp of, you know, dying. So we signed an INF Treaty. We got rid of these missiles. Peace and stability. <laughs> Now the treaty doesn't exist anymore. What is the U.S. doing? We're activating the same brigade. This time we're going to equip them this summer with a system called Dark Eagle. It's a hypersonic capable, uh, missile, meaning that when it's launched five to seven minutes later, it will hit Moscow with 10-point accuracy. Now, it's not a nuclear system, but it's capable of what's called a decapitation strike. That is, you fire it, uh, and when you hit leadership targets, you take them out. Why is this dangerous? Read the Russian military doctrine on nu nuclear warfare release. Two things about it. One, even though they're designed to be a deterrence against nuclear strike, meaning that if you attack Russia with nuclear, they're going to respond nuclear. One of the things that could trigger a Russian nuclear response is a decapitation strike. They said, if you two take any effort to take out our command and control of nuclear weapons, we automatically hit you with everything we got. Now, the other thing about their doctrine is it's not wait until the missiles hit. Although they have a system called dead hand that can handle that, I meaning if you take them out, the dead hand takes over, they fire the missiles anyways. So it doesn't even think about a decapitation strike because the missiles are coming. But the Russian doctrine is launch on warning, which means as soon as they get an indication of a launch. Now, because these are hypersonic missiles, the period between notification of an indication and the missile impacting is under five minutes. That's not much decision-making time. 
So what happens when there's a mistake? What happens if we get an artificial indication of a launch? What happens if there's an accidental launch? What happens if something goes wrong that makes the Russians think that there is an actual launch? They got five minutes to figure it out. And if they don't figure it out, they're hitting the button and the missiles are going. That's the situation we're finding ourselves in today. We're talking about the closest we've ever been to global thermonuclear annihilation. Everybody's talking about it. Everybody's acting as if this is just business as usual. It's not, ladies and gentlemen. This is the end of the world. And it's going to happen because we're dumb. We're stupid. We make mistakes. And we've eliminated any potential for the Russians to sit back and go, could this be a mistake? These missiles can't be allowed to deploy to Germany. They can't be allowed. If they do, it's all it's literally over because there will be a mistake. So how do we stop this from happening? How do we convince the United States this is a bad idea? If you're you're saying what fools the people are who are advising Biden on this, what would you be advising Biden to do? In the war now. How would he do that? You call up Zelensky and say it's over. It's finished. It's done. You're not getting another weapon. You're done. You're finished. We understand you got this $30 million home in Miami. Come to America. Live in peace. I'll make sure you're on the talk shows. We'll get you, you're, you're, you'll be famous. We'll even get you your own comedy show. Uh, you can pretend to be the president of the United States if you want to, but it's over. You're finished, it's done. Then I call Russia and say, it's over, it's over. Okay, what do you need to do to accomplish your mission with, that doesn't involve tanks rolling on the streets? Denazification, let's work on it. Uh, Ukraine will be neutral and per, uh, forever. They'll never join NATO. Uh, we'll, we'll de- but it's over. And when it's over, we we'll also want to sit down and talk about the restructuring of your European security framework that doesn't involve you pointing a pistol at my goddamn head. Okay, we're going to sit down as equals. Russia will say, well, we should have done that before the war. Yes, okay, but we didn't. You know, we're talking about now. But the bottom line is America needs to get this in control. There's something called the OODA loop. There's a, a famous American pilot called Don Boyd, and he, and he was a fighter pilot. His whole thing was he can shoot you down and like 30 seconds because he can get inside your decision-making cycle. The OODA loop is observe, orient, decide, act. And the thing about war is if you're inside your opponent's OODA loop, that means they're reacting to you and you're going to win. Well, Russia is inside our OODA loop right now. We are reacting to Russia. They control every aspect of this. We need to get inside their OODA loop. And you do that by doing what they don't expect. Right now, if Biden wants to flip this, maintain a credible NATO, maintain a credible U.S. presence in Europe, and bring peace to Europe, then you need to end this war right now. No more nonsense about sending artillery that will never be used. No more nonsense about flooding the market with javelins. No more nonsense about anything. No more nonsense about war crimes. End the war now. Find a way to get Russia back into the European community in a meaningful fashion. That will bring peace and prosperity. And I can tell you this, too. If Biden pulled it off, it's a Nobel Prize, and he'll be reelected in 2024. Joe, you want to be president in 2024? Make peace in Ukraine. You want to guarantee you're irrelevant? Keep doing what you're doing. And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to usefulidiots.substack.com. All right, well, that was Scott Ritter, who has, whatever you think about his take, one thing is for sure, it's very different than what we're used to getting in the U.S. mainstream media. Yeah. I'd, I'd recommend uh, that you follow him on Twitter, but you can't do that anymore. <laughs> He's been yeah. banned for life, right? He's banned for life, yeah. yeah. And it's too bad because he brings a perspective from the point of view of a military veteran. He helped implement the INF Treaty, which we talked about, as an inspector. Yeah, he helped. so he's been on the ground inside of Russia. He knows it very well. And, you know, Twitter, whatever, its importance is definitely inflated, but it is a place of debate. It yeah. has some influence. And losing a voice like his, I think, is just it's it's too bad because it it takes out an expert opinion. Doesn't mean he gets everything right, but it, it, he is informed and he does bring a dissenting point of view. And it's it's unfortunate that that's been silenced. Yeah. And I don't think we need to disclaim the, you know, making a statement about Twitter. Yeah. I know that we are extremely online. Twitter isn't the real world, but the media isn't the real world either. And I do see Twitter as kind of an extension of that. Absolutely. And just like the media, 
dissenting voices like Scott Ritter's uh, right. are completely dissented. I mean, you won't see him on CNN or, or MSNBC, nope. that's for sure. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. That's why you come to Useful Idiots. That's right. And if you want more of Useful Idiots, you can go to usefulidiots.substack.com, sign up for bonus features. Yeah, you get an extended interview with Scott. If you thought this was explosive, wait till you hear what he says behind closed paywall paywalls. doors. <laughs> yeah, behind paywalls. Yeah. So make sure you do that. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast. Make sure you rate and review the podcast. We got to beat Pod Save America. We got to beat the Lincoln Project. We got to, we really have to make sure that we are ascendant. So you just like, you rate and review, subscribe to us on YouTube, uh, youtube.com slash useful idiots. And as, as we keep saying, uh, definitely become Substack members. You get extended interviews and you also get ad free content. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody. See you next week. Bye. Hello, thank you so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For full episodes and extended interviews, please subscribe at usefulidiots.substack.com. You can subscribe on YouTube at youtube.com slash usefulidiots for clips, live streams, and full episodes. Also, subscribe to us wherever you find your podcast. Follow us on Twitter at usefulidiotpod and use the hashtag usefulidiotspod. Join us Mondays at 10 a.m. for the Useful Idiots Monday Morning Show, where we discuss the Sunday morning news shows so you don't have to watch them. 